Good, so welcome back everybody um, to the final session. Uh, thank you so much for um, staying to the to the end. Welcome, of course, to those um, still streaming online. Twitter feeds are still open, so please, I would um, please ask you if you do have a Twitter account to to tweet. Um, a lot of these issues have cropped up through the day already. It'd be fascinating to hear these four speakers talk about various aspects of human behaviour. And this um, is the final plenary session. We're going to stick to the model, which has been tried and tested through the afternoon. We're going to have each of the three talks, and then we'll take questions at the end. And again, if you're online, please um, add anything that you would like to onto the chat function, and I'll do my best to identify questions and chat and update the speakers as and when I can do. So, uh, without further ado, it's nice to see Anne Clayson up on the uh, microphone there, and she's from the University of Manchester. She's going to talk about the analysis of UK outbreak data. So, over to you, Anne. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I'm going to follow on um, talking about the Theme 1 work that Chris Keane um, talked about in the, one of the earlier sessions uh, related to outbreak investigation data, uh, in particular trying to uh, link up with the uh, individual site investigations that HSA have been undertaking over the uh, last 18 months. Um, so I would just like to thank uh, some of the collaborators um, at HSE, Chin Chen and uh, Joe, and um, colleagues at University of Manchester and at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, who have, we've all been working together on this um, sort of slightly different approach, a, a qualitative uh, analysis approach to um, a large data set uh, that's been collected over the period of the pandemic um, and trying to make sense of some of the themes and some of the uh, outcomes to learn for future preparedness. Um, so within that work, um, there's a data set of 700, 737 um, outbreak investigations that are linked to HSE um, data sets and they um, equ equate essentially to um, across, the, across Great Britain um, and the majority of the uh, outbreaks uh, that we uh, were dealing with um, really are reflected in the West Midlands, uh, Northwest, um, you can see the East Midlands and Yorkshire, um, and I think that sort of fits in with the pattern of what um, Chris and colleagues have been doing in relation to some of the site investigations. Um, and what we were trying to do is make sense uh, retrospectively um, of this data set, this very rich and hugely varied data set, and so we posed some research questions uh, in relation to this. Um, what are the risk factors associated uh, without rates of um, COVID-19 in workplaces um, that we can see through some of these investigations with HSE. Um, using a thematic analysis approach, uh, how do those themes that have been identified, how do they change over the period of um, the, the pandemic, particularly if we've looked at it over about a 12 to 15 month period, um, and is it possible to identify uh, factors associated with outbreaks and whether or not there's a difference between regions uh, or sectors? And um, importantly, what lessons can be learned from um, the HSE outbreak management data for future emergencies? Um, so within this 737 cases, there uh, are 56 different um, two-digit standard industry code uh, classification codes um, and we followed the, the principle um, in terms of what we wanted to try and show which was to use qualitative methods to identify those factors that may be associated and we did that through um, a large secondary data analysis um, project which is what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, the majority of cases were in the manufacturing sector, um, manufacturing and services, and the work that we undertook focused particularly on those 58% of um, outbreak cases. And we used six different SICK codes um, related to some of the earlier work that you've heard about earlier on today uh, in food manufacturing um, or the production of uh, different manufacturing materials and um, warehousing and postal and courier services. Uh, so the method, which is obviously quite different to a lot of the other work that's on, uh, um, being undertaken in this um, protect study, 
involved a, a three-stage thematic analysis approach. Um, firstly, as researchers at the University of Manchester, we had to become quite familiar with the data from HSE. So that took quite a while to you know, understand the language that HSE talks and um, you know, what, what things meant with the sort of coding, how they code all their information, how they collected it. Um, so familiarization and validation of terms was a really important part of that. From that, we could kind of uh, elicit descriptive statistics. Um, and then that led us to develop a framework for looking at um, a, a large sample across this 737 data set um, to try to then um, deduce and in, uh, induce themes from this data. And uh, the first stage was a deductive um, analysis on a sample. Um, and then we did the classic intercoder review and quality assurance on that and feedback. So we looked at 60 cases using a case analysis template that we devised. And then from there, we transferred that to a coding framework and where we then would identify deductive gaps. So um, things that we might expect to see or why weren't we seeing them and what we can draw from that. And that leads to stage two, which is uh, a cross-sectional deductive and inductive analysis on other inspection outcome fields. I'll talk about that in a moment. So we're currently about to start that on 20 cases. Um, and that's hopefully going to bring us to a point of what we call data saturation in qualitative methodologies and then a writing up. Um, in terms of the early findings, um, and really some of the sort of descriptive statistics uh, and, and factors around categorization. Um, the main kind of no, um, natures of concern that were coming out were around social distancing. And it's probably not that clear on, on your screens, but uh, cleaning regime in the, the first column and then uh, management arrangements um, and face masks, which is a small yellow block or PPE. Um, are quite low there as a uh, nature of concern and the most sort of prolific was um, social distancing and um, I think we've drawn some reasonable conclusions around those factors that were classified as other or unknown um, were likely linked to sort of environmental or organizational factors and you have to bear in mind that these this data was collected from the start of the pandemic so we started looking at this around well, it, the, the frame is from sort of June to, to, to July, but um, I think, you know, the, uh, things may have shifted over that time frame with, like, you know, learning and um, within HSC and um, obviously within workplaces as well. So how things might have changed, we're trying to also understand that. Um, and you'll notice that ventilation is not on there. And, you know, we've kind of tried to, we're thinking, you know, that that's probably classified in other or unknown factors that were difficult to maybe assess for a range of reasons. Um, so there's some minimal classif classification on the initial in, uh, look at the data uh, around the sick code and uh, visit type and nature of concern. And what we're trying to do then looking at all the associated inspection notes and reports is understand a bit more what was going on in these premises at the time of this investigation. Um, and the point about the PPE and the mask wearing, um, the distinctions varied there, and that's quite unclear why that might be. And, you know, that's probably got a lot to do with definitions around what PPE is in terms of at, at, from the start of the pandemic. So, you know, we'd probably like to see some changes over time on that. Um, so drawing out from our um, initial uh, uh, scoping of these 60 cases, um, some interesting themes have arisen um, all around workforce characteristics, uh, environmental factors and workplace transmission um, con uh, controls, um, which those probably most of those you'd probably expect to see as well, but some interesting ones around um, staff tenure, uh, pay sort of type of contract, um, shift patterns and um, location or proximity of home to work seem to link into things like um, likelihood of uh, communal car sharing or lift sharing and uh, associations or um, socialising meeting outside of work um, and also uh, factors around uh, things like social distancing and face covering cleaning did start to come through so your standard kind of controls were there as where there maybe were gaps that would suggest 
there's um that might have been part of the problem why there was there's an outbreak investigation um so um in terms of the coding and themes we've done the stage one which is this qualitative analysis of the report and we're moving on to and where we're mapping we've mapped the thematic analysis and i'll show you just a brief example of what that looks like and then we're moving into the stage two to look at the relationships between the variables and that's quite challenging um, so that's an example of how we've drawn out a lot of the themes and where it, we're carefully adding to this um, mapping as we move through to the uh, second stage, um, looking at this uh, 20 uh, further cases. Um, we're looking at those based on the outcomes from the investigation and we're using four outcomes, which was either no further action, uh, written correspondence, verbal advice or an enforcement notice. And the aim of that is to get to this data saturation point. So we're confident we've got everything we can see and find out of all this uh, information. Um, preliminary findings, um, structural factors appear or seem to be important in the disease transmission. Um, so that's a number of temporary agency and seasonal workers, especially in particular sick code. Um, arrangements around sickness pay, um, presenteeism. Uh, and arrangements other than statutory sick pay or no statutory sick pay, and no ability to work from home, proximity of home to work, as I said, uh, shared accommodation. And um, we're finding that there are indicators that the, managing these environmental factors are very challenging for workplaces. Um, and what's interesting about this work from our perspective is that it's, it's really interesting to be developing some sort of qualitative methodology, looking at retrospectively looking at massive data sets that are out there. Um, there's so much local authority, uh, EHO inspection data, um, former PHC and UK HSA data, and obviously HSE data. So um, we see it as a really important opportunity to inform harmonization of uh, data collection for workplaces around infectious disease control and um, epidemic preparedness. And also, importantly, improve understanding why practices and behaviours are occurring. So in terms of the opportunities, uh, limitations and challenges of quali a qualitative analysis of a very large um, data, secondary data set that's obviously been existed before we could determine the research questions. Um, some of the opportunities really are to glean knowledge and understanding from that data, um, such as investigation reports. Um, a rapid review of intelligence from large data, set, is it, data sets is really possible um, and how you can inform future data uh, system collection methods. Some of the limitations, um, as I said, the day, we're looking at a secondary data set that wasn't designed with a particular purpose, uh, data collection that was designed with a particular question in mind. Um, we do not have enough data about individual roles or activities. Uh, and we certainly can't comment on behaviours, but we can comment on observations about behaviours. And I think that's an important distinction. Some of the challenges are how to reach data saturation and be confident when you've done that. Um, the extreme variation in the data, the quality and the reliability of that per outbreak investigation, I think uh, is something we can learn from. And it's really important to reflect on what we cannot know from the data. Um, and also the methods of, these sort of methods of inquiry are not that as well understood within the quantitative research community. And I think that could be something that we could really learn from. Um, so that's me, thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, that's fantastic. So next up to the microphone is Miranda Lowe, um, going to talk about something that's been, again, that's cropped up through the couple of days in relation to how often we touch our faces. So over to you, Miranda. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we look at behaviors such as face touching, which has come up um, earlier today, and how this fits in with us understanding um, the environmental transmission of COVID-19 and how we model this um, to basically manage risks in workplace and other settings. So how do we contact the virus? Well, I think we all pretty much know that, you know, we have an emission from an infected person into the environment. Uh, it passes through the air, 
it settles on surfaces, it may remain in the air, and this is we get exposed either by an inhaling the droplets or by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching our mucous membranes, our eyes, nose, or mouth. I was about to say ears, but that doesn't really fit in. Um, so what this means, so we know that these are the ways in which the virus is transmitted. And we've heard that there's um, quite a lot of uncertainties, especially around the fomite or surface uh, touch transmission route. So this is important because, you know, when we want to, to understand how we might manage the risks, uh, we like to do sort of some modeling. So we use a tool called quantitative uh, microbial risk assessment. Uh, and it's basically a way of estimating infection risk and giving a quantitative estimate. So for example, saying uh, the risk of um, transmission from environmental factors might be one in a million or one in a hundred. Um, the other benefit of this is that you can also use this type of modeling to estimate the potential impact of interventions to reduce exposure and therefore uh, risk. So what does the QMRA model consist of? Um, Sorry. So like I mentioned earlier, there is usually a term or a, parameters, a parameterization of the emission of virus from a person, whether they are breathing or speaking or coughing, for example. And so we've heard a little bit about um, some of the research that's been going into Protect to help us understand this better. Um, we then kind of have to estimate how that emission from the infected person will travel through the environment, how much of it remains in the air, how much of it would settle on surfaces, how much people touch those surfaces. Um, and if you know, you can get even more detailed and even look at what the surface area of their hands or fingers touching those surfaces might be, and then how that makes it uh, into a person's body via their eyes, nose, or mouth. And then how much that contributes versus inhalation to exposure. So that's exposure assessment part of QMRA. Then we combine that with the dose response ass um, assessment part. So this is understanding the likelihood that for a given dose to person, that person's going to develop an infection. So one of the things that actually um, we don't have a lot of data on is how much people both touch surfaces and face. And in this case, we're very interested is particularly in how much we touch the mucous membranes on the face. But beyond that, um, if you imagine, you know, you might put your hand to um, your face but, and you touch your lips or your nose, but does that result then actually in virus actually making it into your, um, into your digestive tract or your, your nasal passages, for example? So these are kind of the complexities we're trying to face. And this is why I think um, the contact route is, is a fairly uncertain route of, um, of, uh, of transmission and also difficult to model. Although this is actually done quite a lot, if believe it or not. So I do quite a lot of uh, risk assessment in chemical exposure and we do similar models as well. And a lot of data has been collected uh, in that realm as well for um, touch behaviors. So we did a literature review to understand uh, what information there is out there for adult specific behaviors and especially in occupational environments. You can see we found um, not a large number of papers, but there's a variety of occupational settings as well as non-occupational settings in which studies have been done as well in some somewhat controlled environments where you kind of put people in a, uh, in a setting and then you watch what they do. Um, now, how you collect data for this is it's you know not that easy. You imagine um, either you have somebody following around another person or perhaps um, placed in a, a location. You have to watch and actually log every single time a person touches their face and specifically what parts of their face. So that is, you know, you can imagine it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, something that's slightly easier, um, but perhaps is, is more difficult to get an ethical approval from is to have a video camera. Um, and from there, you can, of course, play the video as slow as you want, and then you can more easily log the touches. Obviously, both of these methods are dependent on whether you can see a person at the whole um, the entire time. And obviously, it only captures certain periods of time. And sometimes it's only a very short period of time, a matter of minutes. So these are some of the challenges that we face. Um, you may have seen in the science fair as, um, part if you're here, um, the, there's a group at Newcastle who's now trying to use kind of new technologies where we can use um, sort of this image recognition to try and process data from, for example, from uh, uh, cameras on public transport. We might be able to do this in further uh, settings uh, in the future. So I think that's very exciting because it perhaps takes out some of the labor out of this process. So from that data, how does that fit into the model? So the models that we use are generally 
probabilistic, which means they are based on um, probability distributions. Uh, and you don't get just one number as a result, you get kind of a range of results. So we want to parameterize the data that's collected in the field into probability distributions. And if you're not, if you're not familiar with that, um, an example of that that everybody knows is, is body height um, distributions in the population. You can see in the graph here for women and men, it's more or less what we call normal distribution. So it's symmetrically distributed around a central value where most of the people, for example, uh, the average height for men is like 70 inches, and then it's evenly distributed. Uh, people are taller and shorter than that. So ideally what we do is we want the data that from the actual collected data to, to develop these distributions. Um, you can sort of estimate them based on statistics that are reported in the literature, but that's less informative. So there were some studies where we were able to obtain the data and we fit some distributions to it. Um, it seems that what we call negative binomial distribution is kind of the shape of a distribution fits the data best. But I would just want to show here that um, in the different settings in which these studies were collected, you can see quite a lot of variability in uh, the estimates of um, face touches, and this may be partially due to perhaps data collection methods, but partially also probably due to just natural variability among the population. Uh, we can also look at the different, as I mentioned, we're specifically interested in um, mucous membranes and that uh, there are fewer studies that only focus on this, but, um, but more or less we were able to isolate uh, some of this uh, data information. So how that fits into the modeling now. So, this is just um, kind of a, a simplified representation of one of the models that we've developed. At, so at IOM, uh, we developed a model in an earlier project that is focused more on healthcare um, worker infection. And we're adapting it now under PROTECT to uh, look at some, a few scenarios, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But I'll first talk about kind of the original model that we developed. Um, and essentially, there are four main compartments we look at uh, near an infected patient, further away from them in the same room, um, and then surfaces in those same areas. And we look at how a, a healthcare worker uh, might be performing their activities um, in a kind of a short duration with, with the patient. And then we it's a Markov state model. So we, we estimate, for example, how what the probability of that the worker will be um, inhaling air near the, the patient that's infected versus the problem and the probability that they may be touching different contaminated surfaces and then also touching their face. So that results in the risk of infection for this worker. Uh, I know this is hard to read, but it just kind of shows the complexity of the model. This is actually a fairly simplified version of the parameters there. I do want to point out the orange boxes show areas where interventions, we can incorporate them into the model to look at, for example, the impact of uh, changing ventilation or, or having different types of PPE, for example. So these things can be incorporated in the model. Just as an example, if you were able to, my colleague Mark Cherry had um, a station in the tea room and uh, we, you, you would have been able to sort of play around the model a little bit. Uh, essentially what we have incorporated here is um, aspects of how infectious a person would be. Um, so kind of low versus high infection. And just as an example of the output, you can see on the, the box on the left, it shows a distribution of kind of an average infectiousness, um, the risk to a, a uh, healthcare worker. And we estimate this is about on the median risk of about 600 per 100,000 exposure events. So if you imagine 100,000 um, activities being undertaken repeatedly, perhaps 600 out of those could potentially result in an infection. Whereas if you assume like a pre-peak uh, peak of infection from the patient, um, they're an early state or at a stage in which they're not emitting a lot of, uh, they're less infectious, excuse me, um, the distribution would go down and I believe it's about 60 per 100,000, that would be the reduction in risk. We can also incorporate if they, the healthcare worker was wearing, um, say, an FFP3 versus surgical mask, what might be the impact of that? This is all dependent, of course, of there being data for this, uh, these information out there. Uh, we can also explore what the different contributions of the different routes of infection would be. So here you can see um, in the situation modeled before, um, inhalation would we estimate based on, on the parameters of the model would dominate um, the exposure routes and this is primarily near field inhalation. Um, but in our model, the infectiousness of the uh, patient, the, the infected person, does impact the root, uh, the importance, relative importance of the different routes of transmission. So what you can see is that if 
it's a more highly infectious person uh, or at its, their peak infection rate, um, it's potential that the spray, and so spray means that the person coughs and then the worker is more or less in, in the way of that cough. So that becomes relatively a more important route of um, infection according to our model. So this is just one of um, several QMRI models um, that are being uh, used and protect. And um, Leeds and DSTL also have um, slightly different models which have been developed for different purposes. We are now um, in, the, in the process of developing a, what we call a set of common scenarios where we will run essentially the same scenario with the different models. And this will help us sort of understand uh, how the different models perform, why they, they may give us different results or perhaps they give us the same results. I think it's quite important because um, to, we want to understand, you know, are there certain situations where you might want to use one kind of model or not, or do you, you know, do we need to change some of the modeling assumptions and such? So um, this is kind of what we're doing in this stage and uh, we should hopefully have some results from that uh, in the next period. I do want to acknowledge my team members, um, especially Mark Cherry, uh, who did a lot of heavy lifting in developing the camera model. Um, my colleague, Anne Slayon, who, who also did a lot of work on the face touch review and also colleagues in theme too, who have um, helped and contributed to this presentation. Thanks very much. Um, happy to, well, I'm not taking questions now. Thank you, Miranda, for a fantastic run through. And finally, a double act up to the stage, uh, Sheena and Kath, both from the University of Manchester, and going to talk about enduring prevalence in theme three. Nearly forgot to take my mask off then. You get so used to it, don't you? Uh, first of all, just thank you for staying to the very end. <laughs> um, it's, always, it's always a bit of a hard spot to do, but it's been fascinating. Um, so this project has been mentioned a couple of times over the last couple of days. So I'm really, really pleased to be able to share a little bit of it with you today. Um, in this project, we were looking at areas of enduring prevalence, and we really went out and spoke to directors of public health, wanted to find, ask, they shared their knowledge and experience at the local authority level. Um, we asked them for things like what they thought the potential reasons were for enduring prevalence in their region or in other regions um, that they were familiar with. We also asked them to talk about what potential solutions they might suggest for reducing the rates, and we got some really kind of fascinating insights. Um, so I'm just going to kind of, first of all, just some acknowledgements, really. I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to read all of these names out, um, but obviously it's not just us, there's a huge team of people. Um, in particular, I want to give thanks to Anderley Hartwig and Kath Lewis, who conducted most, if not all, of the interviews with the directors of public health. And actually, I'm going to hand over to Kath shortly, who's going to take you through the findings, because she's much closer to the data um, than I am. So thank you, Kath. I will shut up soon and hand over. Also, thank you to the directors of public health who gave up their time. They're incredibly busy, um, and it was just amazing of them to, to find time to speak to us. They've got such incredible knowledge, and, and they've done such a huge amount of work throughout the pandemic, um, and it's been an honour really to be able to speak to them and to, to kind of gather their thoughts and to um, kind of try and draw it all together and, and then eventually to disseminate it back out. So we think we've, it's been a really valuable piece of work. So we talk about kind of what the aim was though. So we were interested in finding out why some areas seem to have these consistently high prevalence of COVID-19 infections compared to other places what type of local strategies have been put in place, what's been effective, what's been less effective, what are the barriers, uh, what problems have they faced, what problems have they overcome, how can we kind of share that knowledge. Um, and importantly, we were kind of tasked with trying to come up with some suggestions for further research, you know, as guided by the directors of public health. So what did they think it would be useful to take forward? And I actually think it's been really interesting to sit here for the last couple of days and find out about all the things that are going on. And this kind of knowledge is going to be really helpful to us when we're kind of thinking about what we, what we suggest going forward. We've also been um, working with um, a local public health specialist to collect um, more background information on the different regional areas that we've been looking at. So things that seem to be coming out of the data is potentially important that we can use as part of the analysis. 
And these are things such as deprivation levels, um, ethnicity, age structure, employment rates, type of employment. It might be things like the type of housing, the proportion of households, overcrowding, all of these kind of other factors that maybe are important and that we need to be um, taking some um, consideration of. So in terms of the design, we've done qualitative semi-structured interviews with directors of public health. Um, we looked at high prevalence areas and areas um, that weren't identified as high prevalence. The high prevalence areas were identified by PHE. There was a report earlier on this, this year um, that was published, so we were guided by that in terms of the high prevalence areas. We then selected a number of areas as comparison areas, and we, again, we were, we were guided by the experts in terms of what which areas we should include. So we talked to the directors of public health, their, 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 their professional association, the PHE, we looked at statistical comparison areas um, and so on. In addition to these things here, we've also been doing a literature review, and I'd like to thank uh, Nicola Gartland, who's been working really hard on that. Um, and we're, we're just about starting to pull everything together. So it's very preliminary findings that we're sharing today, um, but obviously it's a, it's a really perfect opportunity to do so. So this gives you an indication of the geographical areas that we've been looking at. We've done 19 interviews, all conducted between June and November this year. Um, nine of these were in areas of enduring prevalence and 10 were in comparison areas. So we've got a fairly equal split. All the interviews are completed. All the coding has been completed. We've started the analysis and that's ongoing. Our aim is to disseminate the key findings in January in terms of having a, a briefing summary there. But today we're sharing some preliminary and some early thoughts. Um, and I'm, I'm, on that note, I'll hand over to Cass who will take you through um, what we've found today. Right, thanks. Thanks, Sheena. So these are some of the factors that we found that lead to enduring prevalence. Um, deprivation was something that was mentioned by nearly all the directors of public health in all the local authority areas. Um, as Sheena said, we've got a local authority specialist working with us to try and collect some measures, some quantitative measures to support this work. Um, and that's the deprivation is strongly linked with the areas of enduring prevalence. Other factors that we found were relevant were work was a factor we talked about a lot with the directors. Um, issues around nature of work, so the way that employment was organised in the different local authorities, the sorts of employers that were in, in, um, in each local authority, and whether there were any large workplaces and the type of work. Um, so, for example, one London local authority said they don't have any large workplaces. So workplace transmission hadn't been so much of an issue there. So most of the transmission had been through households. Um, there are a range of other issues linked to employment as well, such as financial insecurity, um, issues around people being on zero hours contracts or not getting sick pay, which made it difficult for them to self-isolate if needed. Also issues around um, commuting and, and car sharing. We also talked a lot about issues around density, so transmission being greater in densely populated areas and issues around people living in overcrowded housing, particularly three generational households, um, increasing the level of risk and the sort of, sort of social connections within, within households as well. So we talked a lot about definitions of a household. So the definition of a household might not be just a single house. It might span down a street and in some examples, spanning down sort of several streets. Motivation for health behavior was something else we discussed a lot as well, um, including structural inequalities. So people having mistrust in the system or feeling disconnected from the state. Therefore, they felt disinclined to go and have a, a test or to get a vaccination. And then as we mentioned earlier in the day as well, people not prioritizing their own health because they had so many other competing priorities, they, they felt they weren't able to. So that's just a quote um, that one of the directors of public health, actually in one of the comparison areas, said um, talking about where isolation was difficult because if someone was on zero hours contract or didn't get sick pay, they didn't want to go and get tested because they couldn't afford to take the 10 days off work. Um, and in some households, you know, there might be two or three different family members all working in the same employer for the same employer or in the same industry. 
So again, on these factors contributing to prevalence, although we compared areas of high, of high prevalence and comparison areas, there was a lot of variation within the local authorities. So nearly all the directors talked about having areas with, with higher prevalence and more deprived areas and also affluent areas. So in the analysis we've compared within local authorities and also compared the two, the two groups. Um, Directors of Public Health had an excellent understanding already, obviously, of their local authority area. So they, they had a good idea of where these areas of, of higher prevalence might be. Um, there were a couple of more surprising findings, such as one director talked about an area where there was high quality of housing, people in high, high um, income jobs, but they still had high rates of prevalence. But generally, the directors you know, had a good idea of where the higher areas are going to be. So this is just about some of the strategies that directors of public health uh, use to reduce prevalence. It was a very large range, so we won't be able to, to talk about them all, but just things like local contact tracing. Um, so the contact tracing initially was done at a national level, but the directors talked about a lot of advantages, advantages of local contact tracing. They already had those links and they already had the, an understanding of the way their local authority worked and the, the geography. They also talked around issues of people having more trust if they got a phone call from a local a local phone number rather than national number, they might be more inclined to answer. Um, and they talked about bringing people in from perhaps adult social housing where bringing staff in to do the contact tracing and the staff already had those excellent skills and they knew how to engage with people over the phone to help assist them to, to isolate if necessary. Um, so again, talking about building on those existing relationships, they talked about working with a range of partners such as housing boards. For example, one director said that if um, somebody tested positive, if, if people who are in prison tested positive, they were still discharged on a certain day. So the directors of public health talked about working with housing boards to help support people to self-isolate. Um, the directors also talked about they developed these partnerships during the pandemic, and then following the pandemic, they were able to build on these on these existing partnerships and the partnerships they developed. Um, so one of the examples that was they developed um, relationships with people in Romani communities while they were being vaccinated, and then once people in those communities had it. I established a relationship with a health professional. They were more likely to come and consult with health professionals on other issues, such as domestic violence or smoking cessation or healthcare in pregnancy. Um, tailored interventions. So the directors employed a very wide range of, of tailored interventions. Um, so some examples of this was if prevalence was high in certain areas, they could use measures such as going out to those areas, perhaps with the vaccination bus. If prevalence was high in certain age groups, that employs different methods, such as engaging perhaps through social media. So yeah, moving on to engagement. So they talked about engaging with a very wide range of people, including employers, communities and schools, um, faith leaders. And they talked about um, consistent continu continuous communication, two-way communication, so finding out what the needs of the community were and attempting to address those needs and trying to tackle myths to help people to get vaccinated. So that's just another quote about some of the strategies employed by directors of public health. Um, it talks about making links with faith settings and also being able to make links with health settings, such as engaging with pharmacists. These are some of the barriers to reducing prevalence that the directors talked about. So the systemic inequalities and deprivation, such as overcrowded households or nature of work, um, people not getting sick pay are issues that they found more difficult to tackle, certainly to tackle quickly. Um, issues around testing, which we've already discussed, such as people not being able to self-isolate because they wouldn't get sick pay. Issues around, some of, a lot of them mentioned there's no sort of national testing strategy, which has made things difficult. The limitations of lateral flow tests and issues regist around registering test results. Um, and then again, we've already mentioned the issues around vaccination, so people having other competing priorities, so not being able to get vaccinated, and perhaps they were hesitant to get vaccinated. 
Um, they talked about national contradictory messages. So I think one director said there have been 200 and like 280 changes to the national rules on um, isolating. So people can't find it hard to keep track of those. This idea of the um, national one size fits all. So at one point, the national advice was if you're going to self, trying to self isolate sort of within a house to prevent household transmission, then you should use a separate bathroom to other members of your household, which obviously doesn't make sense for a lot, you know, people in a lot, a lot of different households. Gaps in data is an issue that's been very, that was mentioned by nearly all the directors of public health, um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. The discussed postcode data wasn't available until summer 2020, which made it difficult to see where the areas of high prevalence actually were within the local authorities. Um, and also that more nuanced data. So there was a gap in getting um, hospitalized people, the numbers of people who were hospitalized and whether they were vaccinated or not. And if they'd had that data, they would have been able to use that data to fit into communication campaigns. Um, and also issues around data sharing. So sometimes the data was available, but the directors weren't able to access it until data sharing agreements were put into place. So again, this is something that came up a lot in the interviews, the idea of COVID highlighting and existing, existing health inequalities. So they already, you know, the areas of, of they were already deprived were the areas that have suffered most from COVID. So they just said that COVID just sort of speeded up some of these issues. One of the things we were asked to look at as part of this research was to generate hypotheses and look at areas for future research. We asked the directors of public health to give us some suggestions for future research. I think the one that came up most often was this one about multi-foot multiple analysis. So we know some of the factors that influence transmission, such as deprivation, um, employment, and um, dem demographics. It's how, how those factors sort of fit together to lead to prevalence and which are the most important of those factors. Other suggestions for further research were understanding the challenges that communities face, developing the evidence base for effective interventions, such as perhaps face masks or social distancing, and the best ways to build on those partnerships and networks that have been established during the pandemic. And um, also looking at how areas recover and planning for future pandemics. That's all from us, thanks very much. Thank you, Kath and Sheena. So we're very tight for time, but I'm very keen if there are some questions that we can maybe fend one or two. So please pop your hand up and make yourself known to the microphone carriers. Miranda, I'm going to start um, because there's a bit on the chat about gender differences in face touching in relation to things like applying beauty products and so on. So is this an issue? And do you think it's going to likely reduce the effectiveness of um, RPE? So, so we did um, actually, I didn't show the slide because in the data, in the studies that we collected, so if I, you remember I showed the slide where um, we looked at the, the median num number of touches in the different settings. So there was one for gender as well. There wasn't actually a difference in the median number of touches, but interestingly, there was a wider confidence interval on the men's. Um, now, you know, this, is probably a function more of the 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 um, the, uh, the studies themselves, you know. So um, there probably are some differences, but surprisingly, you know, according to the data, there aren't in the study that we looked at. Great, thanks, Miranda. Any questions on the floor, Andrew? I'll, I'll shout to you. <laughs> the work you've done on the drone project is really really interesting because you look at it from the point of COVID. So if you look at it from the point of view of COVID, what other health outcomes do you think the information that you're gathering will help us to understand better in relation to those differential outcomes that you might suffer depending on where you live and or what choices you're able to make? Do you want me to, do you want to? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's a number of things. There's a number of health outcomes that we already know are linked to inequalities and linked to deprivation. We know, for example, lifespan is, is linked to that, you know, at a very basic level. 
Um, so I think it, it, I think what COVID's done is maybe shone a light on that. That, that we, we we already know that those inequalities exist. Um, but what this research is maybe allowing us to do is to focus in a little bit more. And we're looking at, you're right, we're looking at it for COVID, but actually what the directors of public health are typically telling us is this is not just a COVID issue. You know, COVID, COVID is bringing it to the forefront because it's being played out in a much faster timeline than, you know, other health impacts do. Um, but actually the default, or so at least some of the defining factors are the same. Um, so I, and I think that to me was a really powerful message. And I think the quote that, that Kaf shared then was, um, I was sat in on that interview and it was, it, was, it was a bit of a breathtaking thing where you go, actually, this is completely right. And, you know, I think maybe we need to, to take account of that a little bit more and think about how we can maybe begin to address those more structural inequalities. Um, but that's obviously a huge issue. So we're almost out of time. I'm just about to hand over to Andrew, but Anne, I think it would be only fair to ask you one question. Um, those are fascinating qualitative data. So will one size fits all when we start to inform our policy colleagues or have discussions with our policy colleagues about how we write advice here? Or do you think there's significant geographic, demographic differences in the themes that were emerging in the workplaces? Um. I, th I think I think there probably are um, across dif across the different sick codes and um, for various reasons around the sort of nature of um, employment, the type of employer, um, the size of the business. So um, I think you can you can draw conclusions that it is a one size fit all, but how that actually is implemented in practice and what really goes on on the shop floor, you know, is is is. Going to be is hugely variable and i think that links back into lots of other factors around enduring prevalence and the nature of employment and precariousness of employment for a lot of people yeah no thanks and you unfortunately have confirmed my suspicions that it's not going to be that easy is it anyway thank you very much to all the speakers and perhaps i'll hand over now to andrew for some closing remarks thank you Thanks much, David, and thanks to all the speakers. Fantastic, uh, as always. And I've just been asked if I can uh, provide a brief summary uh, of our time together and a couple of closing remarks. I don't want to keep you long because obviously it's getting dark outside and the trains to catch. But um, the first thing I would say is that two weeks ago we didn't have a conference. Um, we had no venue. We had no place to eat. And so everything that you have experienced over the last two days has been pulled together. Uh, with enormous skill, um, great fortitude, and a lot of effort. Uh, so I want to have a, a, a very big round of applause for Ed and Michael, Ed in particular, because Ed has spent a huge amount of time making everything work. And I think um, if you hadn't known, you would not have guessed that we'd had to rearrange this at very short notice. So if we have a very big round of applause for Ed, please. I just want to extend that thanks to the venue. I think they've done a brilliant job. It's worked extremely well. Um, we've got so much data on carbon dioxide. It's probably the most uh, measured room in the world at the moment. So that's really valuable. And thank you for doing that for us. Thanks to all the speakers, um, because without the speakers, we wouldn't have had anything to talk about today. Um, and thanks to all of you, both in the room and online. I think this has been a fantastic opportunity for us to come together for the first time. Um, and if I was just to finally reflect on what is different as a consequence of what we've all shared over the last couple of days, the first is that it's made the programme better because it's enabled some creativity. I've seen lots of conversations going on. I know that studies are changing as we speak because people have had discussions with colleagues that they haven't been able to have previously. It's therefore supported the connections, the connections between people, the connections that will last for many, many years, I'm sure, and enrich the research that you will do throughout your own careers. And then finally, I think it's created a sense of community, uh, a protect research community. We had it there a little bit, but actually those communities only really work when you can interact as humans. And the fact that 
we stuck with it. We were able to pull this event together to enable us to meet face to face, I think was absolutely uh, critical because that ability to make those connections uh, and create a sense of community is absolutely what we need to move this program forward. So I'll just close by thanking everybody once again and uh, wishing you a very safe journey home. And I hope to see you again in face, in person, face to face in the very near future. Thank you very much indeed.